6.6 mistakes. We've talked about this probably two or three times. You say something wrong, inappropriate. Yeah. Listen, we're people, right? You know, we can all act like we're perfect and we're politically correct and everything is beautiful, but sometimes it slips out. <laughs> sometimes we, maybe I shouldn't have said that. And there was nothing wrong with what I said, but there's women in here and that's going to offend them. Or there's, there's some political people over here and there's the guy who likes, you know, Dale you know, Earnhardt. And uh, there's the, the guy from the Northern, you know, so you get like, up. Oh, should have said that, you know what I mean? And so if it creates a compliment, hey, listen, guys, you know, so you got it, whatever you do wrong, just be honest about it. <clears throat> Move on. Yes. Yeah, it, Mike, even technically, you know, I could be speaking about something, but I'm speaking from a particular context, and I thought that that context was clear. I find out I get a comment from the audience, and the, the audience comment is totally correct. It's in another context. That gives me the opportunity to say, hey, you know, you're right. I was speaking in a small context here, and thank you for pointing that out. Um, you know, larger issue, so well, stuff like that. one of the problems right here, let's talk about this right here. I'm making all these statements. Somebody might say, well, that doesn't apply to me. I mean, I would never have more than 300 people in the class, and I don't care about having this thing. It's like, why are you talking about that? And, like, I never had a person I'd have to kick out of the class. It's all you. I mean, I understand all of that. So when we're making comments and statements, we're making general, Right. So you have to understand the context, and right. I don't know your specific exact circumstance. So my general comment would work, but it doesn't work for your specific circumstance. So there's a danger whenever we right. teach that we're making broad strokes, but there are specifics that will change the the perfect theory into the practical reality. Right. You know, so we have person have to know that. But it's great when they ask you that. I say, oh, okay, wait a minute, yeah, you're right about that. When I was saying that, you know, this all works this way, you know, you know, you're right. I've had physicists tell me, listen, Mike, the way you're explaining electricity, it doesn't work that way. It really, electrons really don't move what you're saying it. And you, I've seen, Eric, you said that's called what? Where you have something, it's, all models are wrong. But some are useful for teaching. But they're useful for teaching. Right. So it's not always perfect. But somebody might catch that and you say, okay, yeah, you're right. You're right. So let's, let's move on. Let's don't belabor that. And we're talking about moving on, not belaboring it. <laughs> 6.7. Make your point. Nail it down. What you want the students to learn. And then move on. This is a very difficult thing for people to understand. Just say what you want to say. Get it done. And be careful that you don't keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Pull boxes and junction boxes. Okay, you get explaining pool and junction boxes, a person will get it. You talk about it much more, bingo, they lose everything you said before you start. So you have to learn, okay, let me just get to this point and let me stop it. It's enough information for now. So take a look at the slide. Be 100 prepared and don't let them sidetrack you. Make your point. Don't start distracting with, well, what about if you had this and what about if you had that? Say, so listen, we'll get that at break time. Not right now. 6.8, taking notes. I am, I'm interesting about that. I've taken seminars, and I find that I'm not quite sure why I do that. Maybe I'm trying to show up. I don't know. But I sit there the whole time, and I'm writing all these detailed notes that I'd never read before again. And I'm not sure if, if, if I'm connecting in some way, if I'm writing something down, but I generally am not a note taker. And I would not want anybody in my class feeling compelled to take notes. I want my material, which is my textbooks, I want everything to be there. I want you to be able to be relaxed. I want you to be able to open the book. I want you to take notes if you want to take notes. But I would not want to tell somebody, hey, listen, you have to take notes, and then you got to review your notes in order to make this successful. Now, some studies show that the act of taking notes helps students remember. I don't know if that's true or not. I'd have to do the research whether that's true. But if you're not a note taker, you're not a note taker. That's the way it works. Notes force people to think about what they're learning and forcing them to process in a different part of the brain. If I was going to take a note, I think my notes would make no sense to me or anybody else after I took my notes. Right. Because I'm taking notes in between things, but the moment you say something else, then I'm listening to that, then I'm now taking a different note. And I happen to be halfway through the first note. So I'm not quite sure what, what's happening there. Well, what I, I, I read something. Uh, in a book about about the brain, and and in my experience, it's true. Um, 
with phone numbers, for example. When somebody gives me a phone number, I'll write it down. And then I'll never even look at it, and I'll dial that number. But the simple act of, of utilizing different portions of your brain to, to process the same piece of information, uh, allegedly, it, it helps you remember it, right? So if I, just, if I just recited the phone number you gave me, I would forget it. But by reciting it and writing it down, it, it lodges deeper in the brain. You're saying if I met you for the first time and you gave me your name right. and your city and I wrote it down. Right. There's a higher probability by me writing. What was it? Was it, it was Michael? Oh, it was it was Michael. And from where? Okay, exactly. I'm from South Dakota. Now you could throw that piece of paper away. There's a higher probability that right. I'm going to remember your Michael from South Dakota. Right. That I'm talking to you and I have all the stimulus. My brain is doing all these calculations, and then you're right. giving me Michael, and it never, it never got stuck there. Right. But but writing it for sure is a different part of the brain. Right. Than hearing it, Brian. Well, you know, if we go back to uh, part two where we talked about learning styles, I think what is probably the most common is when there's not a good presentation graphic, there's not something engaging for a visual learner, then they're going to make their own visual learning tool. And so they're going to be taking notes and writing. And I, that's the way I am, for sure. If, it, if it's not a really great PowerPoint and not a really great oh. handout, I, I make more notes, but I don't ever look at them again. I just need to make them so that I can get it into my brain. I think you're right about that. If I don't have something that I can see, I'm more likely to draw something and make a note about that than other things. Like, oh, I see, I'm entertained. I, I got that. It's like, whoa, that, that one, let me... Let, Okay, I move, we'll continue on. Some students want to listen with all their attention instead of taking notes, so don't make it an issue. Don't say, okay, guys, everybody better take notes. Your notes are going to be... Uh, that's just not me. Provide a text which the notes taking isn't necessary or essential for the students to completely focus on what they're saying. My system, the way I design it is, we have DVDs, we have textbooks, we have summaries, we have practice questions, we have challenge questions, we have online quizzes. It all ties it together, and all you got to do is take one step at a time. And if you have an instructor in class, the instructor uses the PowerPoints with the students. Everything is just very, very, very easy for success. So that's just the way we design our products. 6.9, presentation structure. Discuss the scope of the class. Maybe not discuss it, or maybe just... Explain what the scope of the class is. Remember, the structure is this. There's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end. Interestingly, Brian and I were working last night and early this morning putting together the PowerPoints, and one of the very first things I did was went to unit part four this morning, opened the first slide, the PowerPoint, I'm like, I didn't know what that PowerPoint, I knew what it was saying, but then I didn't remember what, as so I had to go to slide before, like, well, what are we talking, oh, it was the presentation. I'm like, oh, then I went back to the slide. In other words, even in our very first slide in part four, we had no beginning. So we had to have a beginning of every single section in our book. Then there's what? Then there's a middle. And when we get done with the middle, we do what? Then there's a summary. So this beginning, middle, and end applies to everything in life. So when we get to a class, we have a beginning, there's a middle and there's an end. In our presentation. Beginning, what do you plan to teach? Tell them, hey, listen, we're covering motors, conductor sizing and protection, air conditioning as well. The middle, okay, we go to the exercises. There's an end, then there's a summary. What do we teach you? Then we give you some practices. Feedback, what did you learn? Well, that's when we quiz you. Right? We find out, and then you, your results just gives me the feedback and how good I did it as teaching you. 6.10, questions. Acknowledge a questioner or questions so they know you understand that they have a question. And even in this DVD recording, I'm, I'm watching here. I'm looking at the live stream questions that are coming in here because I have a computer to my left. I have a computer right here in the center, which is my PowerPoints at the same time. And in peripheral vision, I'm seeing Scotty the cameraman right now, watching what's going on inside here. In my peripheral vision, over here on the left-hand side, I have the panel members, and I'm watching their body language. I'm seeing they're going, or they're going, okay, or, or, or they, they raise their hand. And then I'll look over to the body, the, the panel members over here, and I'm seeing Ryan, and I'm talking to Ryan. But when I'm looking at Ryan, I see Brian put up a finger, 
You know, in the back of me in the camera, he just puts a finger, and I look at him, and I do what? I give you an acknowledgement. I, Scotty, get a picture of me here. Here's what I'll do. I'll be looking at the team member, or I'll see Eric, and then I'll, I'll look at them, and I, and I go like that. They're not like, and I'm watching Ryan. They're like, you don't know. So what you want to do in a classroom setting is you want to make sure that you acknowledge the person. You might have three or four people ask questions, and I'll go like this. And then, and then. So they can see I go this, this, and this. Go ahead and keep going, Eric. So they know what the order is. And then I, when you get someone, Eric, I go, okay, we're there. And then I, I lean over to that. I say, okay, now we're there. And then I go over here. Wasn't there something? Okay, and then I go over there. So what that does is it relaxes the person, realize, okay, you acknowledged me that I have a question. Maybe right now is not the right time, and so you're going to wait till we get there, and then you're going to bring me. Okay, so, so what was your question? You had something about that? Oh, no, no, you got it, what I was talking about. Oh, okay, that's good. And we got that taken care of. Then allow them to speak after the current or preceding question has been answered. We just kind of go down the line. Clear answer. Answer questions with a short, crisp, and clear response. And some of us know presenters that that's just not possible. It's not possible. They go, history of mankind and the history of the code process and the whole thing, and you just want to know. Which you, I, don't, I just want to know right now. And I'm pretty good because I'm so linear. I'm so absolute. I'm so right to the point of using, giving, nope, yep. Now, this is an interesting thing I've learned the last couple of years, and I think I shared it with a couple of you guys, and that is this. When I get questions now, Present it to me, um, email to me. I always reply with a code reference, no more. That's it. I don't say what the code says. Hey, Mike, you know, does the, I have a 400 amp feeder and I want to run this size wire and I'm going to be going over 20 feet. Would that be okay? I reply back C250 21B2 or B3. Right? I mean, 240. Yeah, I was going to say, 240. Unrounded system. So 240, no. 21B3. Right. Yeah. 25 foot tap rules. Right. If you have any questions, let me know. Because guess what? If I give them this written language, I might not. I, I, I'm just saying what I'm thinking. The best thing is, I give you the code rule, you read what it really says. If you have a problem, I said, and I'll usually say with this tell me what you think. And I say, what, Brian, 25% of the times? Maximum. They don't, they give me the answer wrong yeah. after they read the rule. And I say, well, I need you to read that again yep. because the inspector is right, and I need you to see why he's right. Where before I'd be writing all the stuff down, explaining all kinds of stuff, so I reduce myself. So as an instructor, my advice to you, when you get a code, are you talking to a guy, it's a different story, right? Would you, would listen, but if you're talking to a guy, what would you have to do, Brian? Ryan? Whatever your name is. If you're talking to a guy and we're in a classroom and you ask a code question, what yeah. would you have to do? You'd, well, you give him a code answer. I mean, I, you give him the code rule. Right. And you'd have to have a code book. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how could you answer a question without having a code book? Right. So yeah, what, what you're I. The same thing. Right. Get your code book here. Right. Take a look at this. Read that and let me know if you have a question on that. Yeah, what I mean, the way I, I usually do it is I, I have the code book on my, on my computer, so I just. You know, Alt Tab. I, I open. You know, when in the morning when I first get there, I open my presentation right. and I open the code book because I know I'm going to use both of them. And it's no different than an email. The only yeah. difference is that you just give them the code rule. Right. Yeah, read exactly. It. You go to give it. Me read the code book. Yep. Come back to me. Mm -hmm. And so what it does is it removes the fight. Yeah. I, I'm just. You don't like the rule? Listen, I, I don't tell you. That's what's right. going on. Now let's go on. So short, crisp answers. Mine's a code reference usually. Don't give useless information to the answer. Right. They don't want all that information. You know, some people really don't want the answer at all, but I mean, you know, if you're giving them an answer. Convoluted questions. If you receive a convoluted question, ask the student to repeat it. Eric, I read a little thing that you wrote that you sent last night to me or this morning, and I read that I thought, I thought it was brilliant the way you said it, and you said, look, if you, t listen, are we asking a question of a student that we haven't taught? Do we ask questions from students no. On a topic we haven't taught. Okay, so we've taught it. Yeah. Which means that if you ask a question relative to what we talked about, and I taught it to you, if you ask me a question that doesn't make any sense, that means that I didn't do a good job of teaching you. Right? 
because you can't even phrase the question because it, it's wrong. Or you ask me a question that clearly you understand what I'm saying. You're really trying to get some confirmation in there. You're going to get a convoluted question when it's something you haven't taught. Hey, Mike, I have a question which is unrelated to what you're teaching. It's something tied in that they, they thought about something. So realize when you teach something and somebody asks you a question, the question should make sense because you taught that specific point. If you didn't teach the point and are asking you a, a question, well, what about if you do this and all this stuff? It's not even related with that at all. What you can do is this. Or sometimes people, they're, they're confused. Say, listen, hold on. I'm not quite sure what you're saying. Can you say it again? That gives them time to process the words because they got the words a little nervous. They're not trying to do this whole thing. And usually the second time that they ask the question, then you find out it becomes clear. Right? Well, well and... and you know, maybe, maybe I'm just, my evilness is coming out. Sometimes it's just a bad question. You know, some people say, oh, there's no such thing as a bad question. Well, yeah, there is, you know. And sometimes people will ask a question that doesn't even make sense. And, or, or, or you just can't quite understand what's being asked. And what I've done is after asking them to repeat it, ask the, ask the audience for help, you know. Say, look, I, I'm not quite sure that I understand that that situation. Has anybody ever yeah. had any experience with that? Maybe, you know, in reality, you're saying, I don't have a clue what this dude's even talking about, you know, and maybe somebody can get you there. Well, you know? sometimes so I say, is, you, don't hey, have to do, you don't have to be an island. Does anybody understand what he's trying to say? Because right. I'm not getting it. Yeah, Mike, right. what he's trying to say is this, right. like, yeah. oh, I didn't know they made a product like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. They make it like, oh, okay, hold on, hold on. Okay. Now that I understand, okay, I'm sorry. Ask me the question again, because now I can understand right. the question. Oh, that's 12 inches. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I, I totally was. I was like, into some complicated thing there. Brian. Well, I'm just speaking from personal experience, and, and I've gotten much better about this as I've gotten older, but I think by talking through something, and sometimes when I'm asking the question, in order for me to ask it, I have to ask it. And then I realize as I'm saying it, I'm not saying what I really want to say, but since I'm in the middle of the class and I'm asking you, I'm trying to make it work. And so when you say, I'm not understanding the question, could you repeat it? And I'm like, good. okay, good. here's what I want to know. <laughs> because I couldn't figure out how to get that out. But watch this. Sometimes people are so confused, and this is why they're confused. Th their entire life, their entire career, they known something to be this way. Yeah. You now have given them an answer right. that something is completely different. It, it's Lenz Law. It's, it's Kirchhoff's Law. It's Ohm's Law. It's absolute. It's fact. It, it's not even a question. But because it is so contrary to what they have, mem they have wired into their brain, that they cannot, they cannot conceive, they cannot bring these two things together, and now guess what they are? They are totally confused. I joke with, with people when I teach class in grounding and bonding. How many of you guys have been doing this for more than 25 years? And these guys are all proud. Yeah, it's me, man. I've been doing it for 35 years. I'm like, it's probably too late to teach you, okay? <laughs> you are so screwed up. You are so wired in a certain way that what I have to tell you is probably significantly different, and all that's going to do is really, really confuse you. So you have to recognize as an instructor that when you're teaching something that's contrary to what somebody thinks, it's very difficult for them to even hear what you're saying, and so that's where there'd be some confusion. And then you have to say, look, I I'm sorry. I, I Get with me a breakdown, but right. uh, I got to move on. Repeat the question as you understand it so that the class hears the question. Exactly. Doing so verifies that you understand the issue. Eric, you want to tell us this is something that you're passionate about? Yeah. <laughs> I, now that I've, I've taught for quite a while, I think I'm getting to be a worse student, actually. Um, one of my big pet peeves, well, when I'm, when I'm teaching, whenever someone, even if it's a small class, if someone asks a question, I always repeat it. Sometimes I've done... Uh, conferences that are that are connected into another site sometimes are being recorded and you have to repeat the question so that you get it you know you get it captured so when I'm sitting there as a student and I'm, I might be say in the middle of the class there's someone soft-spoken on the front row have no clue what that person asked can't hear a thing and then the teacher just starts talking right. I'm like what is what is that what is it about 
You know, it's, yeah, so always, if you're an instructor, always repeat the question. So watch that, little tiny things. Now there's something I do do sometimes. Sometimes somebody will ask me a question and everything was perfect. I got what I wanted to get done. This question is now going to mess up what I achieved. And I'll say no to the person. Because I, because I Mike, Mike, when you hear the question, I say, listen, I don't want you to hear the question. Right? <laughs> Trust me, you know, I, I don't want you to hear that question. So you have to make compromises inside here. <laughs> All right. Help the student think his or her way through the troubling issues. Are, are you trying to say, Ryan, Brian, as you, are you, so you're trying to help the guy, oh, okay, so you want to help him with that question so they can, give it, can you repeat that question? Do you mean this? Make sure you understand what we're saying. Yep. And then you answer the question. The centers. Hey, I think everything you just said was total BS. Listen to the thing with your eyes. Here she feels that you're giving them serious attention, like, okay. Don't disagree negatively. Just ease into it such as, that's a good point. That's yeah, not that, politically what I would say. You know what I mean? That's just not. Me. Here's what I do. I'll tell you a story. One time I was at a contractor in Miami, a 20-story high-rise building, and it was, the permit department was on some floor, okay? And I, I never went there before, but I've been there a couple times, but I mean, very rare, so I couldn't remember the floor. So I get to the building, and I'm an electrical contractor, and I'm all stressed out. You know, today wasn't a good day in the electrical contracting business, you know what I mean? I'm running around. I'm trying to get the permit. I hate to go to the whole thing. I get into the, the building. I say, hey, listen, I see a guy. He's, he's walking there. I said, listen, he's going in the elevator. Listen. What floor is, is, the, is the permit that, for electrical permits? He's, I think he said 12th. I'm like, no, it's not. It's the 10th. So now we're both in the elevator. So, and, and I asked him, I'm going to press the button. I said, no, it's not. It's the 10th. You know what he does to me? He looks at me and he goes, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, right. oh, wow. His name is Juan in Miami. Oh. He's maintenance. <laughs> He's the maintenance guy for the building. Okay. He's obviously the expert. I asked him a question. He gave me the answer. I disagree with him. He says, okay, the elevator door closes, and now what button do I have to press? <laughs> you know what I mean? The one he said. I pressed 10. <laughs> so he goes past 10. Wherever floor he goes past. But I press 10. I get off at 10. The moment I get off at 10, I realize, okay. Wrong floor. This is the wrong floor. <laughs> so now I have two choices to get to what he said it was, which was 12. My option was what? Go up the stairs and be a weenie so I don't see him in an elevator, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or take the elevator. Which way do you think I went? Stairs. 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 <laughs> I go up the stairs, and it's the 12th floor, and I'm like, dang, I'm always so wrong when I fight with I'm always wrong when I disagree with people. Here's my lesson learned after that. When somebody asks me a question, and I know that I know that I know the answer, and the person disagrees with me, I'm just going to say, and I try to answer, you know, try different, you know, and yeah. you get to the point you realize, okay, yeah. we'll move on to the next slide. All right, whatever. whatever you want to think is fine. Let students know that you can be wrong right up front. Hey, don't even believe me. Challenge me. Question me. Hold me accountable. Don't allow them to continue to argue an unsubstantiated opinion. Listen, I don't care what you think. Give me a code rule. As soon as you find a code rule, as soon as you find a manufacturer, as soon as you get the website, listen, you got your iPhone, you got your iPad, go on the internet, get me something. But I'm not going to argue with you. Sorry, got to move on because I got to move on. I got to, I'm supposed to get the slide number blank at a certain given time and I can't sit there and spend 20 minutes arguing a point that probably none of us care about. We have to stay within the scope of the class. Yes. We have to finish our agenda. We had a plan. There was a beginning. There's a middle. There's an end. This is not something that gets convoluted and it gets hijacked by somebody with a crusade or somebody's going to be disagreeing with me or somebody that's confused. I'm sorry. We got to keep moving. Tell them to discuss their point with you after the class. Not a problem. I'm not blowing you off, but now, not now. I'm sorry. Got to keep moving. Don't fake it. You don't know the answer. I don't know. I've said this probably three or four times. Ask them to email you the question and tell them you'll get back with them. Let me give you a little history here. Somebody would ask me a question, and I felt compelled to answer their question. I would write their question down. I would write their phone number down. I would go home and do all kinds of research. Right. Then I would call the guy back when we didn't have emails. Now I would email the guy with all the information. And I realized, no, I'm not doing it anymore. 
you have a question for me in class, and I can't give you the answer right here, here's my email address. I'll tell you guys on the de- It's Mike at MikeHolt.com. Email me. Do you know what percentage of the questions people ask me in the class that I don't have the ability to give them the answer right there in the class, the percentage of the questions that actually get emailed to me? Probably 10. 10? Two or three. Yeah, two or three yeah. percent. Rare. That, here's the deal. They had this passionate question in the class, and they really wanted to fight with you about it. Right. Okay? You say, listen, I'm not going to argue with you about it. i tell you what, though. You email me. I will do the research. I will give you the information to support what I'm trying to tell you. I will take care of that. And I found out they don't care. Not enough to even send me an email. It's the smallest percentage of people. But in the classroom, it appears to be this great big deal. So what I do now in the class, listen, I'm not going to fight with you, but I tell you what, to be fair here, email me, Mike at MikeHolt.com, exactly what you're asking for. I will get you some substantiation. I'll get you the white paper. I'll find a UL report somewhere, the NFPA, something. I'll get that to you, and you and I are going to be on a great page. Not a problem there at all. Eh. Zero chance that they're going to do that. Now, the best thing, anybody has questions for you or for me or anything like that, is I get lots and lots of email questions. I refer them to the code forum at mycode.com. Now, if I get a question for somebody, email me something that is a simple, straightforward question. I send them back to code reference. It's no big deal. But they give me a, listen, I, I got a 2000 busway, and I'm going to be tapping off at this. I'm, I'm thinking about putting in parallel lugs, and I'm thinking about this, and then it gets, well, now we're talking consulting. Now we're talking design. I don't have the time to get into all the little details. At that point, post that on the code forum, and, and I, I, I don't provide a consulting service. I say call Ryan Jackson. You know, I say call Eric Stromberg. You guys provide a consulting <laughs> service. So that's how I would handle those kind of questions. Here's the code forum. We have, I don't know how many, I know it's over a million, maybe a million and a half posts on our forum. So, I mean, this broken down, you can't really see that on your TV screen, but go to MikeHolt.com. And go to the code form. You really will be very, very pleased with the results on that. Continuing questions. Never use trick questions. But you know what I find out? A trick question is to me is where you have a calculation that if you forgot the three-phase, you get the answer. But the an- question was a three-phase question. I could say it's a trick question if you want to say it's a trick question. But I find out people who miss questions, usually true-false questions, and they miss it like, well, that's a trick question. And I'm like, and what I do with people like that is like, in, in my case, I'm like, okay, well then tell me how I write the question on a true-false question so it's not a trick question so that it's false. <laughs> I mean, give me the information. So if you're writing exams, if you're doing things like that, which if you use our product, you don't have to because they're already pre-programmed, they're already pre-made, but just be aware. You don't want to be playing games and cute things. Guys have enough problems just simply with the fundamental basics. You don't have to make it complicated. Just teach them. It takes effort to get the students to understand, to feel good about themselves. So we never want to do anything negatively by playing games with questions. Don't make them feel badly. And I've learned over the years there's certain topics, because I've studied this, people cannot even understand. Neutral calculations, okay? Very difficult thing with nonlinear loads and linear loads and ranges and dryers. and, And I've learned that the more math calculations, the more steps in math you have to have, the lower and lower the percentage of people getting those kind of problems correct. So math is a difficult thing when you have lots of multiple levels at math to work from. Don't become defensive if a student asks a question and you don't know the answer. Don't become defensive. I don't know if we're going to have it in here at all, but don't become defensive if a student challenges you in the class because he went on the Internet and says, I think you got BS here. I just went on the Mike Holt form. I, you know, whatever the case may be. Sometimes, you know, a guy will call me up. I say, well, you got my number. You call me up. Okay, well, well, you know what I mean? And then he'll call me in the class while the instructor's there. Hey, I got Mike Holt on the line. You know what I mean? Hey, that can happen. I mean, so it, it can happen. So just like, wow, really? Oh, okay. I um, guess I'm wrong. I mean, if, if support yourself. But don't, don't be defensive. Listen, I have been corrected for 40 years by doing surveys. Even today, Ryan, you've corrected me a couple times. You know, just off the video, you say, uh, you, you and I don't have to say a lot of words. You say, Mike, I'm like, I got it. I know exactly right. what I did wrong. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, so the thing is this. I can get better. I can improve. I can continue to improve because I'm willing to be able to have you guys correct me. 
without making it defensive. Like, oh, don't worry. No, there's a reason why I did that. You don't understand what it. No, no, no. Stop the BS. You know what I mean? Just be honest with yourself. Somebody's going to correct you, and you should thank that one-year apprentice student that came in your class and said, wait a minute now. I don't think what you're saying is right, and you've been doing this for 10 years, teaching the same thing, and nobody's ever challenged you. Well, then, you know what? Take the opportunity to grow and learn because that person is helping you grow. Never be defensive when people are challenging you. Encourage that and realize, you know, there's a chance you can be wrong here. <laughs> it really is a good chance you could be wrong. Don't intimidate the students so they're afraid to ask a question. Never ask the class a question you haven't already explained, right? That's, we talked, that's fundamentals. This is just basic 101. Never single out a particular student to answer a question and put them here or her on the spot. Hey, Joe, so what's the answer to that? No. Would you say, hey, guys, how many guys think they know the answer? They raise their hand. Okay. okay. Like I say, you guys, you, you 12 guys. Okay. What do you think the answer is? So you let the ones that are comfortable participate at that level. Others are like, no, no, they know, you know, that, that's not the personality to be getting themselves in show and to be showing off. There are people, there are people like me, like, hey, I'm the first one to get the answer, and I want to let you know I know the answer. I mean, that's, that's the way it works. So keep them busy. No questions. What do you do if you, okay, you get done? It's like, okay, there is no questions. Well, I've had this happen. A lot of times, a trainer-trainer class, when it's non-technical, estimating business, when you're talking to people, because this is so new, this is even new enough where, realize, everything we've been saying in this, deep, in this video here, this is all opinion, right? It's all opinion. This is what I think. This is what's worked for me. Well, you might say, none of this works for me, and I wouldn't even waste my time watching the video. Fair enough, okay? <laughs> but because it's new for you and it's opinion, we don't have facts that we can say right or wrong. So there's no big challenging that takes place there, right? There's no challenge. You can just say, well, I wouldn't do it that way. Okay, well, I would. All right, well, there, now let's move on. I mean, what else <laughs> yeah. can we, I mean, there isn't a whole lot we can do. I agree with you. Good. Fantastic. Well, let's move on. So, there's, so things move kind of quickly like that. And, but when you're telling people that they think, wait a minute now, I never thought about that. So here's what happens. You're teaching something that's not a fact, it's not technical, it's not something they've done, it's something, and they're hearing it. Or it's new, like an apprentice, and it's like, it's so new they're thinking it out. And then it goes on the next one, then they're, they're thinking that out. So they're doing so much thinking that they, they can't even formulate a question. Right. Because this is, there's not a question, I don't know. How can I have a question? You're just telling me something I didn't know, and now I know it. it, isn't, it it's only when I've been doing this for enough time that I know that the wire size is this size, and I know this is how you calculate it. Now I can get involved. In, in, so be careful. Sometimes no questions doesn't mean you didn't do a good job. It just means that you're teaching people brand new material that they have nothing to compare it on, so they're not confused. They're, they're just learning. Or maybe they are confused. I think if you do a good job, I don't think, I think if they're confused, they're going to ask you a question because they have something. So I don't think it's, they're confused. You stepped on the toes. Yeah, I can see. You kind of like, you know, you kind of blew somebody up and everybody's like, eh, I'm not asking this guy any questions. You never reached them. They, they, have, they, they, they weren't paying attention. I don't think good instructors would have that issue at all. You talked about their level of interest. In other words, you're just at a level. Well, I guess that's a thanks thing, not, not interested. Uh, they just, just, I don't know. I don't really care. You talked about the level of knowledge, level of interest. I don't even care about this. So I'm here because I have to be here, and so I really don't have any questions because I'm thinking about what time is it and when are we going to get out of here. I back my pickup trucks. I mean, I'm ready to go straight out when we get out of this door here. Too much detail. Overwhelmed. You gave them more than a need. So you got to be aware when you create your program, what do I want them? What's the beginning? What's the middle? What's the end? I don't want to give them too much right now. We slowly build pieces and we put building blocks, not too much. They think it's disrespect disrespectful to the structure. I don't know, but I think there are some cultures that don't want to challenge the inspector. I mean, the instructor. They, they don't want to question it. They, they just, okay, and they just go along with how it works. They have something else in their minds. They're not even thinking about the questions. They're thinking, man, what am I going to do? My, my daughter's I got to pick her up with this. You know, man, I hope my mother's going to be okay. Uh, gosh, the car, the wife called up. You know, she's pregnant. You know, I hope she's going to, you know, they're not even there. You didn't make it clear that you welcome comments and questions. They didn't know. Oh. You know what's the funny thing about, weird thing is, with 
all the years that I do seminars, and I, I make myself available before the class, at break times, lunch time, at the afternoon break, afternoon of the class, it's not uncommon for me and my fir survey to have, I wish Mike made an opportunity for us to ask questions. Yeah. And I'm like, and I tell him in class, listen, do not put on my survey that you wish you had time, I had time, for you to ask, do not put that on my survey. Because, and I, of course, what do you think they do? Hey, I wish you had time to ask questions. You know, just, they just kind of jerk in my chain there. So you will get people that won't ask a question. You're available. Then they say, well, I wish you, had made, the, I wish you made a time for us to ask questions. I'm like, what's wrong with break time? What's wrong with lunch time? I mean, if I, I don't understand. Maybe you hurried to the program at the end. You gave the impression, like, I, I need to get out of here. I got things I got to do. Um, anybody have any questions? Uh, okay, we, we're out of the time. Good, because I got to get this. I got to go on. Challenge them to participate. Develop a connection of ideas, emotions, creativity between you and your students. Get that, get that relaxed state where there, there's playfulness. I don't think, Mike, and, and after a while, I notice my, my students, they throw statements that I say to them. They start throwing those statements back to me. I don't think so, Mike. And I'm like, well, what are, you, what are you talking about? Well, look at this. I'm like, oh, okay. They're seeking approval. Some people asking questions. You're thinking, why are you asking that question? Clearly, you know the question. Clearly, you know the answer. Right. <clears throat> and why are you asking the question? That, that's probably the hardest thing for me is asking a question that you know the answer. And I guess they're seeking an answer. But you know what I find? Some people, they just, I just, it is, a, you want to, <coughs> they just want to be sure that what I'm thinking is right. I'm like, oh, Okay. What about students answering other students' questions? I love it. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can't do that until what? Until I've taught it, right? And now we're working on a Voltstrap calculation, and we're, we're doing uh, you know, something in, in hazardous locations, and a guy has to say, hey, well, what about if you had this and that? Now, that's a what about. That's not part of my program, right? And these, you know, let it go. Let it go. And what it gives you, it gives you the knowledge to find out, oh, Obviously, you didn't do that good of a job because the guy that's asking the question doesn't make any sense, and the guy that's answering it is answering it totally wrong. Hold on, guys. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let me go back. Let's go back, and let's review how the purpose of seals on boundaries between the classifications. Let's understand the concept. See, the key here is we're not trying to memorize code. Is that right? We're, 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 I and, and I don't want, understand we're it. just trying you to understand how things work, the fundamental, the basics. And then with that, then you got to go into the code book. But there's a reason. It's called physics, right? We have to understand what takes place and why it takes place because you have explosions, you have fires, you have air pressures, right? You have all these things. So let's understand how this works. And now look at, oh, now it makes sense why the code is saying what it's saying. So we want to get to the fundamentals. You know, students answering questions facilitates discussion, interaction. You know what it also does? It gives you a break. Uh-huh. <laughs> you sit back. That's where you have your stool. Is that right? Not a seat, because right. that indicates I'm checking out. Yeah. You sit back on the back of a table. Sometimes I even sit on a table. But, man, almost enough that I sit like if there's no bar stool. Just sit on the table for a second, and uh, that's when I get my water. Mm-hmm. Take a drink, see I'm talking, and I'm like, I'm not what they're doing right. I'm like, yeah. So I'm letting them know. They look at me. I'm like, like, well, anyways, what you're supposed to do is this, and they're looking at me, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. I say, hey, he did a better job explaining it. Sometimes mm -hmm. the students actually do a better job explaining it than you ever did. You're like, I like the way you said that. <laughs> I'll have to remember to do that. Yeah. So facilitate that. Encourage people to become part of the process. This helps you understand what they've learned. Ryan? I was going to say, you know, I, sometimes it's, it's hard for me during, during this to, to think about apprenticeship and think about presenting and things because right now I'm thinking of a, of a classroom type of environment where we're students answering each other's questions. And then I'm thinking in, in my world as a presenter, um, sometimes, it, sometimes you don't even know it until, until you're halfway through presenting. Sometimes there's, a, class, there's a, a guy in the class that is an absolute expert on something yes. and if he's there 
and he can answer a question, why not have him answer the question? I mean, in, in addition to giving you a break, you know, the, the students like hearing a different person's voice for a change, you know, and you can, you can tell them, look, this guy's an authority on it. So I'm a big proponent of letting other people answer questions. Excellent. You know, I just got watching the streaming questions coming in, so don't delete them yet because they're very good. One of the guys was saying, maybe when somebody's asking a question that we clearly know they have the answer, he's saying maybe they're asking a question to which they know the answer because their friend who doesn't know the answer is afraid to ask. Yeah. But another one just occurred to me. We need to put that in the book. Another one is that maybe they're asking a question because they want to make sure that the other person in class hears the yes. answer. Right. Because the way I said it was kind of general, but Mike, let me ask you a specific one. If I ran this size and if I did it exactly this way, this, 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 I'm thinking to myself, well, why are you giving me all the specifications? <laughs> because obviously it applies to every one of those conditions. And I'm like, well, absolutely. Mm -hmm. you're, so, you're, so this would be correct. Is that right? I'm thinking... Well, you know it's correct, but it's what you're asking me. So, so now, actually, right. what that does for me now, it encourages me to understand this guy wants to answer his question so that he can blow up the inspector because yeah. the inspector's in the classroom yeah. saying, no, you can't do it that way. And sometimes people ask, Mike, listen, there's inspectors in here that won't do it that way. Da, 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 da. Huh. And so I said, well, asking the question. What oh, a great opportunity. I said, okay, tell you what. It's a break question, yeah. right? Guys, I got a question in the class wanting to know about da, 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 da. And so, therefore, I know it's to blow up the inspector mm -hmm. because he wants the inspector to know it. Because if you're an inspector, you're responsible to know the code, right? Not, not to go off and do your own thing there. So there's another one. Somebody else is afraid, and he's trying to help the guy, and he, he, I don't agree with that, so uh, a friend. Or he wants somebody else to know for a fact the answer. Okay. Good stuff, guys. Students answering student questions continuing. If the answer's correct, hey. Yep, I agree, guys. You guys are doing a great job. If the answer's wrong, well, then we got to go back, do a little review of that subject so we can kind of all get together on the same page. Don't allow long discussions outside the scope of the class. You know, it can migrate. It can migrate. So you got to realize, okay, stop, stop, do, do, that's it. Uh, uh, no, 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 that, done. Next slide, let's go. And that's what we do. Verify you answer the question. After you've answered a question, ask, did I answer your question? And I mentioned to you, about 1% or 2% of the times is like, no. I'm like, oh, then what was your question? Okay, 6.11 survey evaluation. This is something I absolutely love and I absolutely hate. And we'll make sure that it's part of a download part of this program here in the PDF, my survey. And I'm going to talk about the details, but this has transformed me completely and this will make a big difference in your career okay have an evaluation so you can better understand how to communicate with your student it makes a difference in what you're going to do or not do learn what worked and what areas need to be improved and I'm, and I'm making these statements learn what worked, learn what needs to be improved better understand and communicate with your students okay those are nice generic words but the reality is when you see the survey questions then I think you're going to understand the significance like ooh, wow and I was looking quickly if I had any surveys because sometimes they'll scan them and they'll send me all the surveys from the from the site and I wanted to show you some examples of what would look like which be real site live surveys and I think Brian maybe that'd be something that we can do that maybe one of my surveys and one of your, you know, just get a bunch of surveys and people can say, wow, I didn't see how that worked out. 6.11. With the text or? Yeah, when I, actually somebody, a real live, will, the next June class, we'll get them and we'll find, okay, that would be great. Where well, they have good handwritten, you know, you can see, well, oh, I can see where you can get some value out of that. Okay, personal value. Don't allow yourself to become devastated by a few negative comments. I can say that, but it doesn't work for me. I'll have a class of 500 people and 490 would tell me, man, you're the greatest guy in the world. Man, I love you. And there'll be like seven people that you're a jerk. I can't believe you. You do this. And I'm like, oh, they hate me. I did a terrible job. I'm like devastated. So when I get done with my seminar, any seminar, I don't want to see it. I, I can't. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I don't want to know what they think. I'll wait until the next day or I'm in the airplane coming home and I'm like, okay, let's see what I did wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I go to him like, you know, I, I'm pleasantly surprised. And when you're at, at a more calmer state rather than being vulnerable and being tired, 
Um, and especially if you did the class and you don't feel like, uh, like Brian, you did this, the race down at Amelia Earhart and you thought your second lap uh, wasn't that good. I mean, but when you found out, hey, you know what? You actually did better than yeah. you thought yeah. you did. You know Way I mean? after the race, too. It was yeah. like hours later, I was like, huh, that wasn't bad. Yeah. <laughs> so when you do a survey, you know what I mean? You might find out you actually did a lot better than you thought you did. They, they came across better than you thought. You just, it wasn't my best inside there. Okay. So try not to let the negative comments affect you, but it, it affects me. Use the evaluation for self-improvement. That's what this is about. That's all about is how can you improve yourself, which means that you want honest answers. <clears throat> it may take years to become really confident in your teaching ability, and it's going to take time. Update your class based on the feedback. As people tell you things, be, listen, they're trying to be honest with you. Change your class. Use an assistant to help make notes on areas that you want to change or improve. What I always did, I don't do that anymore. It's interesting. Huh. I always had an assistant in class. It's a student that took my class the last time, that wanted to take the class again. Or somebody in the class who's really, really, really sharp. And, you know, when you're running a class, it's very difficult as one person. I know why I don't do that. I got all the staff people in the world around me. Okay, I got I'm you. I'm why you don't do that. <laughs> okay, I'm thinking, <laughs> why do I not do that anymore? Well, I got like, my seminars, eight, ten people there. So that's a totally different story. When you're by yourself and you're teaching a class by yourself and you may be handling registrations and entries and, and grading and all this other stuff, you know what I mean? It can be overwhelming that you're not able to do what you want. Get yourself the sharp student. Say, hey, listen, would you be willing to help me? And you're there, hey, listen, can you, be, can you check on that air conditioning? Go ask that guy to drop that thing down one degree. Okay, and he goes inside there and say, listen, you know what I mean? We're having lunch. May, find out what, in other words, you can use somebody to class to be able to help you make some of the decisions. Because, see, if you get assistance like that, then you can stay focused. It's when you start getting distracted that it's going to affect your performance. And then also you're looking at how do I can improve my performance. Get a student volunteer. Offer a previous student a free class to work with you as a volunteer. You know, hey, every time I do a seminar, uh, you can come. You know what I mean? You don't, you don't pay anything, and I'll get you lunch, and you can just come and hang out with me, and we'll work together. And then you make notes. Hey, changes, 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 changes. Timing. Don't leave the evaluation until the last minute. I usually put the evaluation out in the afternoon break. So break is like at Three, I don't know, yeah, probably put it in the first break in the app. Either between two, would be, we get one, 2.15 or 3.45. Somewhere in there, I don't know, the office has a plan. The, so at least by the 3.45. We want them to have the time to do it. So I probably put it out at 2.15. So they have the 2.15 break, then they have the 3.45 break, so they can have the time to fill it out. You start putting it out five minutes before you, hey, guys, listen, I need to get this evaluation. Can you do me a favor? And then, they're out of there at the end of the day. And then you're not going to get the feedback you're looking for. Right. Now, here are the questions that I ask. How important was the subject matter? You know, there are people who are taking your class that they're chemical engineers. There are people that they don't care about this at all. Uh, the importance was zero. Well, then when I look at the evaluation, if the person gives me negative things, well, I can appreciate, well, it wasn't relevant. He didn't do a good job. Well, you know, because you didn't want to be there. Fair enough. How well did the seminar meet your needs? Well, that's important because obviously it is relevant to the person. And so therefore, how good of a job did we do? That's like a 1 to 10 kind of scale. <clears throat> Was the presentation interesting and informative? I'm just, this is kind of like measuring... Uh, my presentation skills. How good did I do? Kind of like, you know, was it interesting? Was it informative? Did I kind of capture your attention? That's kind of like, how good did I do? The next one. Was the technical content appropriate? No, not at all. You know, well, yeah, yeah, it was, that, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. That, that was exactly what I was coming from. Was it worth your time to attend? And that's important because we don't want somebody there like, no, it wasn't worth my time. Overall, how would you rate the program or the seminar? And that's a biggie because you can have individual things like, oh, I think it was a nine. Oh, okay, I feel better, but you gave me a two and something else. <laughs> how would you rate the presentation skills? In other words, how good was the presenter? Was it? And then we ask specific sub-questions. Rate them from zero to ten. Their knowledge of the subject. Oh, the guy was brilliant. The guy knew everything. 
it was a terrible program, and I would never want to take it again. But the guy was surely, he knew everything. So we're looking for, you know, where is your strength and weaknesses? How good was the person responsive to questions? And we want to challenge you to make sure that you are being accountable. How good was the presenter to adapt to the student's needs? The ability to present ideas and concepts in a clear manner. So these are little tiny details that I'm looking at. How good did he use visual aids? Well, even with my professional PowerPoints and the graphics and everything the best I know of that we can possibly do, I still get people saying, well, I think you could have done a better job on the visual aids. And I'm like, okay, you know. So even though you're doing the best you can, that doesn't mean that everybody thinks you're doing as good as it can be. So you have to think, well, maybe I can add some video to the class. Uh, maybe I can add some more photos, some more images. Think, how can I make this thing a little bit better? And we're continuing to do that. And now that we have Brian House working with us full time, we're, we're hoping to really take the PowerPoints even to the next level, even make it better. What was the most important thing you learned today? That is the num that is, I won't say the only thing I look at, but when I do a survey, that is, pr that is for sure the number one thing was what was the most important thing that I said. And that's the one line that I get the most surprises from. Like, wow, that person thought that was the most important thing. So it, it gives me some inspiration. Like, okay, that was the most important thing. So next time I do this, I got to make sure that I cover that particular point. This is another very important question for me. What concept was the most difficult for you to grasp? I really zero in on these things. What was the most, what was really, really hard was how this could do this and that could do that. What that means is that I have to be better prepared, add more slides, or do a better job in my textbooks to try to do a better job to help them understand this concept that was difficult for them. What was especially good about the session? Now, I like that question. Because if they don't answer anything at all, I mean, I, I, there's nothing wrong, right? It's, so if they answer something, that means that they're going to get, this one I like because I'm going to get some, oh, Mike, you're doing a great job, good boy. You know what I mean? So uh, that one feels good. So I'll look at that one. Okay, what was especially good about the session? Sometimes it's like lunch. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cookies, you know, that kind of silly stuff. But no, it's usually a good question. What were you disappointed about? That's important. Well, I was disappointed that, mm. like, I don't want to disappoint anybody. I mean, I can act like I'm this tough guy, but I'm really not that tough guy, and I really don't want to disappoint anybody, and it kills me if I disappoint you. So I'm always wanting to, to please people and, and to make them feel important. So that's a good one. Like, wow, really disappointed that you, I'm like, okay, got to work on that. How could a session be improved? You know, when you hear something, well, it was a, a one-day program. It should have been two days. As a presenter, I don't have the control of yeah. that, you know, and it's, that's fine, which is good. That means it's a good thing. Is that right? So that's it's, a very positive yeah. It's a positive thing. Anytime somebody says that, I know I did my job. Right. They're like, man, because so, they realize he has a lot more information. Yep. And, yep. man, I wish I would be able to be with this person even that much longer so that I can get that information. Do you have any comments or suggestions concerning your instructor? Hey, have him come back again. You know, I mean, I think he was a great guy. You know, I was surprised. I thought he was going to be this way, but he was that way. And, you know, or, you know, hey, you know what? The way he treated that guy in the class, I was really surprised. I thought the way he made that comment, that woman had to be uncomfortable. And, you know, I mean, that one person was sitting in there. He didn't understand that that person was this and that. You know what I mean? And they're like, ooh, wow. See, you can do something innocently, genuinely, and because there's different cultures and there's different people are different places, and you might use slang, it, it, anything of a thousand little tiny things, that's right? Yep. Not realizing, oh, mm -hmm. that bothered somebody? <laughs> Can you imagine that bothering anybody? But you would never know that, right? You just keep doing it every time. You wouldn't even know that. Mm -hmm. Listen, I know it's innocent. I know, fine, but... It does bother somebody. So yeah. Yeah. why would you do something that you know bothers somebody? Eric? Yeah, if you're going, uh, one of the good things to do is maybe Google hand gestures because there's a lot of hand gestures that mean different things in different countries, and it's pretty yes. surprising. Now, 
We're done with evaluation. A couple final points I want to make here. You don't want to email your students the evaluation, ask them to respond. You're going to get 5% maybe. I can't imagine getting a 10% response, probably closer to 5%. So you're not, and you know what? They're doing it at a time that they're not emotionally impacted. They're just, uh, yeah, that click, 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 and that's going to be it. So you don't want to do that. Also, what you really need to do is you need to provide the time for them. Say, listen, guys, I'm going to take five minutes. I need you to do me a favor, please. This is really important to me. I need every one of you to take the five minutes. Give me that survey. Give me the feedback because it helps me understand. It helps me become a better presenter, what you liked, what you didn't like, what was complicated, how I can improve. You know, so please. And then I would stop. I go back. I get my coffee or whatever it is. I sit down for a couple of minutes, give me a few minutes, and then you get close to 100% yeah. response in that. Because then they're like, oh, okay, I'm not getting out of here. You know, right. it's, it's <laughs> in the middle. It's only two, it's only whatever o'clock. So I'm not stressed out about doing it. But if you wait to the end, then they're, they're not going to do it. So you reduce it. So we want to get it up to 75% or above on our surveys.